the Duke is back. No, not that one, he never went away. Hail to the king, baby. And no, not that one either. Christ, who writes this crap? This is the Duke. Well, it's the nickname given to the original Xbox controller at the very least. Why is it called the Duke? Well, look at the size of this thing. It's huge, just like a Duke. Apparently, the true story is that Microsoft's project manager, Brett Schneff's son, was called a Duke, and it just seemed to fit. Or not. <laughs> Bundled with the original Xbox in 2001, it had a mixed reception, with some claiming it was simply too large and unwieldy. I mean, it was almost three times the size of a PlayStation DualShock. Proof that we saps must be on our guard. Just like the Sega Saturn, Japan received their own smaller controller, known as the Xbox Controller S, which proved more popular and became the default bundled controller in the US during 2002 and worldwide by 2003, mainly due to the uproar about the original. But the Duke always remained available as an accessory, whether you knew it actually as the Duke or another such as Beast or Fatty. Personally, I loved it. This felt like a console for adults, and I was at a stage where I was just getting back into gaming properly after neglecting it for a couple of years. Maybe if I'd have been 10 years younger in 2001, then I would have felt differently about this vast pad. But as it was, it just felt sturdy, dependable, and solid in my palms. But other people didn't always agree, with it frequently appearing in worst controller lists next to the Jaguar pad. That's another one of my favourite controllers. Is it me? I mean, maybe I just like huge controllers. I don't have terribly large hands even, but I'll admit I do like to stretch my hands. The PlayStation pad always felt terribly cramped for my personal taste, although to all intents and purposes it's a great controller. However, it seems the design of this bulky controller was more designed to fit its internals rather than designed to fit hands. With Microsoft being the huge company it is, and different teams working on different areas, the controller circuit board was actually produced larger than expected. And so, the controller skin also needed to be larger than expected. Denise Chowdhury, who took up the main bulk of this task, faced an uphill struggle, but came up with the infamous Duke. But its size caused more anger than predicted. It doesn't matter what you think, Bill. Seamus Blackley, the man who really instigated the design of the Xbox, had items like golf balls hurled at him on stage. And hence why Japan had a more suitably sized device, launching several months later, with the huge internal board split in half. Still, if you take the horrific prototype designs circling around Microsoft in 1999, I think even the haters should be somewhat grateful with what we got. Anyway, the point is, it's now 2018, and Hyperkin have revived the Duke in USB form, compatible with both the Xbox One and Windows machines. So how did this new edition come to be? Well, the aforementioned Seamus Blackley apparently posted a photo on Twitter of his son holding an original Duke pad for scale, and the internet went wild. For many, I suspect this was, and remains, a very definite case of rose-tinted spectacles. But for die-hard fans like myself, it was a trigger moment, no pun intended, to instigate a re-release. All you have to do is look back through Blackley's tweets to see the excitement building, along with some nice looking bread, his early prototype designs, and even Mary Jane's fish and chip shop from my hometown of Cromer in Norfolk. I didn't realise you were a fan, Seamus. But this isn't the first time this was spoken of, the controller that is. Way back in 2011, there were rumours of a Duke return, to coincide with the Xbox 360's HD remake of Halo Combat Evolved. It's only taken seven years later, and we finally have it. So I suppose I'd best get it out of the box. It's all rather nice, we've got the glossy box to tempt you in, which I should note is necessary given I paid £69.99 for this. 
some details on the back there, and oh look, snapshots of the startup animation. Nice. Inside we have an acknowledgement card and a quick start guide. All very simple really, plug in the USB and you're good to go. Ah, here it is. Hello old friend. I'd actually forgotten how bulky this thing is, but I, I really love it. And that's not just nostalgia talking. I genuinely love the fit of this controller. You can see how weenie an Xbox One pad is in comparison. On first impression, everything feels pretty much the same as I remember it, but the first impressions don't mean a lot around here. We need to test this beast out. This test begins with the Xbox One. Being a wired controller, I connected it via the front USB port. Now, it seems a bit strange using a wired controller with a new system, but I quite like it. It feels warming and vintage. Plus, I had no issues with wire length. In fact, at 9 feet long, it's exactly the same length as the original controller cord, although it's not that funky translucent design of the original. But it meant I could sit on the sofa without issue. On plugging in, you get an acknowledgement rumble, along with the original Xbox startup animation on the center button. An animation Microsoft apparently couldn't find a video of. And that's because it's all created algorithmically in code, which is blooming impressive. Now this is a nice touch, but it feels a little wasted. My memories wander back to the Dreamcast controller, another beast which had portable memory sticks, offering in-game information and even the ability to act as miniature games consoles in themselves. Yet this OLED is a one-trick pony, and it's not a very useful trick. It's like having a comedy doorbell. It's great once or twice, but fundamentally, no one gives a crap. Now if we could hack it and put it to good use, then that's a different story. All right, dudes. But you know, it doesn't matter. I always found the massive Xbox logo on the original Duke a waste of space as well. At least it now also functions as a button, allowing full navigation of the Xbox environment. Although we don't get the hidden infrared LEDs for Kinect pairing, but who used them anyway? It's pretty seamless moving from a current generation pad to this one. You have to hold it a bit differently, and for the portion of people who hated the extra reach required for the white and black buttons, their functionality is replicated in an addition to the design. And these little shoulder buttons, offering a more contemporary position. Obviously these are what we now call the right and left bumper buttons, and I actually prefer the positioning here. I've always found the RB and LB buttons a pain in the sack if I'm honest. I love trigger buttons, but those shoulder buttons have always felt awkward. Having them slanted to the side like this feels more pleasing to my hands, and I can always default back to the good old fashioned buttons if it takes my fancy, if I can reach them anyway. Another addition is the headset jack underneath, mirroring current functionality. These are all discrete additions which don't take away from the Duke's original design, and on face value it has exactly the same button layout as the original, although with nods to their current usage conventions. Of course, we don't have the hefty memory pack slots of the original, but otherwise the controller is almost identical to the original design. The plastic is smoother and a bit cheaper than the original, but it still feels nice. The triggers are more spongy and have more give than the original, but again they feel pretty good. The analog sticks feel smooth and responsive, just like the original, which apparently were offset due to some Tony Hawk Pro Skater players on the design team who thought it would make the game more fun. The directional pad is clunky and wavy, as it always was, but usable. The rumble and impulse trigger vibration feels strong and clean, and the buttons themselves have a similar responsiveness to the original Duke. This is all in all a well-made piece of kit with significant attention to detail, but then it is £69.99 for a wired controller. Thankfully then, it can be also used with your PC. It states Windows 10 on the box, and I'll admit I haven't tried it with anything else, but I'm sure there are ways to make it work with previous operating systems. Don't hold me to that. It refused to function with my USB 3 hub, but good old USB 2 had us sailing away. Now clearly this isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea. 
I mean, that's evident simply from the responses I got on Twitter, which is why you shouldn't buy it if it isn't. But I thought to be on the safe side, I'd also give it a trial with some smaller hands. Here we have my son. He has tiny seven-year-old hands, like a weakling, but yet apparently finds it perfectly fine. Good. Is it too big? Well, it's a bit too big because I'm not used to it. This is the first time using one of these. But does it? Is it okay? Yes. It's not too big, is it? You can still reach all the buttons. Yeah, it's a bit bigger than the normal Xbox One controller. In fact, he now insists on using it instead of his standard Xbox One pads. So, I guess I've lost that. Anyway, that's the Hyperkin Duke. A little on the expensive side, but if you're a fan of the original, it may just be worth it. And even if you're not, this is really the controller which laid the foundation of what many of us consider to be the perfect controller today. Let's not get into the PlayStation argument. What would you give it, give it out of 10? A rating out of 10? Um, for this? Yeah. Um, probably... Six? Thanks for watching this short review and history thing. There's some more videos there, subscribe, contribute to my Patreon to help, uh, or just leave, it's up to you really. In any case, have a great evening.